Hello, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on indicators for green economy policymaking. My name is Benjamin Simmons and I serve as the head of the Green Growth Knowledge Platform Secretariat. Uh, before we begin today's webinar, I would like to provide a few words of introduction established a few years ago by the uh, Global Green Growth Institute, the OECD, United Nations Environment, and the World Bank. The Green Growth Knowledge Platform is a global partnership of over 55 leading international organizations, research institutes, and think tanks committed to collaboratively generating, managing, and sharing green growth knowledge and data. I wanted to take this opportunity to mention that the fifth GGKP annual conference will take place from the 27th to the 28th of November and is being hosted this year by the World Bank in Washington, D.C. on the theme of building sustainable infrastructure. Over 40 papers on the topic of sustainable infrastructure will be discussed at the conference. We hope that many of you will be able to join what we hope will be an extremely informative event. Now for today's event, we are delighted to be hosting today's webinar in collaboration with the Partnership for Action on Green Economy, otherwise known as the PAGE Initiative. The PAGE Initiative draws together five UN agencies, UN Environment, the International Labor Organization, UN Development Program, UN Industrial Development Organization, and the UN Institute for Training and Research. And their mission is to support countries who are interested in pursuing sustainable economic development. Today's joint webinar is actually the first in a two-part series. In today's webinar, we, we, we will be focused on the PAGE Initiative's work to develop national level green economy indicators and to introduce a new green economy progress measurement framework. The second webinar will take place in three weeks on the 10th of October and will focus on the PAGE Initiative's new integrated green economy modeling framework. We will be circulating more information in the registration for this webinar closer to the date. Before introducing our esteemed moderator for today's webinar, I'd like to highlight a few logistical issues. First, we strongly encourage participants to raise questions to the speakers throughout the webinar. This can be done by typing your question into the chat box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the webinar dashboard. Your questions will be submitted to our technical staff, who will then repost them to all the participants for our panelists to address during the question and answer period. We will also be circulating a survey after the webinar concludes, and I, will encourage, and I would encourage you to complete this as it provides us with valuable feedback to help shape our future webinars. Finally, if you have any technical issues with the webinar, please email us at contact at ggkp.org and we will help you troubleshoot. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Professor Bruno Overlay. Uh, Professor Overlay heads the Green Economy and Resource Governance Chair at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. He also heads up the International Risk Governance Center at the same university. In 1999, Professor Overlay was appointed Deputy Director of the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment, Forests and Landscapes, and in 2005, Director of the then newly established Swiss Federal Office for the Environment. Starting in 2005, Bruno also represented Switzerland as Secretary of State for the Environment. Uh, Professor Overlay also has the distinction of serving as both a panel member of the International Resource Panel and, and, and close to my heart, an advisory committee member of the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. So Professor Overlay is now my great pleasure to turn the podium over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, good uh, afternoon to everyone to this uh, webinar session. Uh, it, will, uh, uh, it will stand till uh, 5.30 this afternoon. Uh, we will then have to close the session. We have, uh, uh, as a starter, four uh, for, uh, contributions uh, for distinguished uh, researcher. Uh, it will be, uh, the first one will be Fulai Sheng. Uh, Fulai Sheng is the head of the Research and Partnership Unit at, UN at the UNEP in Geneva. Uh, and this uh, led the UNEP report on uh, towards a green economy, pathway to sustainable development and poverty eradication. Uh, for nearly 30 years, Fulai served as an economist at the Chinese Ministry of Finance, the World Bank, WWF International, Conservation International, and so on. And since 2005 at UNEP, his major work uh, include green economy policy assessment, integrated policy making, and green national accounting. Uh, a big expert in this field, uh, it just now is uh, unable to uh, use his computer, so it will be uh, with us through an iPhone, and uh, uh, you see on the screen uh, a picture of it. 
Eiffel Eye, you hear me? Um, we will then have uh, um, Mr. Sunil Dovrakasin. Uh, he's a senior portfolio manager for Greenpeace International. He focuses on the renewable initiative in Africa. He was a distinguished member of the parliament for Mauritius and the Pan African Parliament and was a senior advisor to the Prime Minister of Mauritius, Mauritius in the year 2010 till 2014. We will then have uh, Jose Pineda. Jose Pineda is, a, is an adjunct professor at the South School of Business in the University of uh, British Columbia. He was a senior researcher at UNDP uh, Human Development Report, the senior consultant on green economy with the UN environment. Uh, Jose uh, was a senior researcher at UNDP. He said he, was, he has an extensive research experience in the field of international trade and open macroeconomics. Prior to joining the UN, he was Deputy Director of uh, Research for Andean Development Bank and is also served as a Chief Economist of the Venezuelan American Chamber of Commerce and the Industry. And last, the last speaker will be Andrea Bassi. Andrea Bassi is a, a Senior Project Leader and Researcher. Uh, he is also founder and CEO of the uh, Knowledge <coughs> Limited. He is also an extraordinary associate professor of system dynamics at Stellenbosch University and is uh, an associate member of the IST um, uh, International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, his uh, earlier experience includes uh, director of project development, modeling at Millennium Institute, and visiting researcher at Seminole Institute. I, uh, <clears throat> I welcome you, you all here, and I would like now to uh, ask uh, Fulai Sheng to uh, start with his presentation. Please, Fulai. So, Bruno, uh, my apologies. This is uh, Benjamin Simmons. Unfortunately, uh, Fulai is connecting. Um, from uh, from China and has had some uh, connection problems, so um, he's not he's unavailable at this stage. Okay, so we go we go then to uh, to Sunil. Sunil, oh Sunil, thank you very much that you you will be, you will make the start because we have some connection problem with Pulai. Uh, please, I hand over the 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 the, the, the word to you. Thank you, Bruno, and um, well, hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be on this webinar and uh, to showcase uh, uh, what uh, Mauritius has achieved in terms of uh, the green economy uh, pathway. Um, so for those uh, who don't know my island, I would just quickly give a small introduction. Mauritius is a small island. Uh, in the Indian Ocean with 1.3 million inhabitants. Uh, just like any other small island developing states, it also faces a lot of uh, impacts from uh, climate change. And uh, eventually, um, uh, we have a lot of challenges as well. Uh, Mauritius is a democratic country where elections is being held every five years. So that's just to give you an idea of the governance structure. We have a sort of a prime ministership and uh, a president is there, but it's an honorary president. So quickly to jump into the subject, it's like why the green economy uh, for Mauritius? Uh, in the year around 2009, um, the prime minister decided to launch a project which was an ambitious project called Mauritius Jurab. The name is in French. If I translate it, it would be like Mauritius, the sustainable island. But it's like, this is like a literal uh, translation. So Maurice Iljurab, which we call the MID, uh, was like to be an ambitious project, how we transform the island to be a sustainable island uh, uh, and could serve as a model for the seeds as a whole. And then uh, right from 2009, we, we embarked on this, indeed, on this ambitious project by developing an indigenous plan of action uh, and that took us like, it was a bottom top approach and that took us like two years to meet all the organizations in the country, to discuss with everybody, all the stake players, 
uh, non-state actors, uh, NGOs, civil society organizations try to understand what they would like to see uh, Mauritius be in the next uh, 50 years or so. So we were just uh, putting down the foundation to transform the country and to make the country a sustainable model. Uh, at the same time, uh, together with that process, uh, which took us like two years, and then we came up with an action plan, and we came up with what we call the mid strategy, which was also a, 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 a strategy for the next three years, how do we transform the country? And the whole plan was to be financed by the government from our own budget. So that was the ambitious project we had, and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I have to also mention that we ran this project for four years, and now there was a change in government by in 2014. This whole project was dismantled. That's the bad side of it. Uh, so, but during that four years, we try, we achieved a lot. It was like uh, we pioneered a little bit together with some other small islands, what we call the natural capital accounting. That is how do we internalize the externalities, and also we developed uh, the VRP vulnerable resilience index altogether. So that was some of the work that we did. But then we started, okay, we need to take this work to the next level. And the next level would be now how do we uh, transform the economy of the country? How do we make the economy uh, become sustainable, become green, and become a low carbon economy? And this is where we, uh, we think that the green economy project uh, fitted very much in our plan. And we started working on it all together with UNAP and some with our UNDP office in Mauritius. So what was, what was the green economy uh, roadmap? So it was like we thought that most probably let us start by, let us start by eventually uh, greening, uh, greening six sectors. And we had chosen agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, waste, transport, and water as those six entry points because um, in my next slide, I will, I will refer to why those six sectors uh, were chosen as entry points to our work. So the, we had a two-step process. We said, okay, let us start by greening the existing uh, sectors of the economy, and then we, we are going to deep dive and trying to understand how do we create new pillar of the economy because Mauritius is a small island, but it is an ocean state. So uh, how do we develop new pillars of the economy in terms of most probably looking deeper inside renewable energy sector, waste recycling could be another sector that we could develop as, as well. How do we uh, try to increase the percentage of green jobs within the country? So that's what they, a little bit the idea. Firstly, to green existing sectors and then think about what will be the new pillar, the green new green pillars that we can add up to the economy so that we can increase the GDP. And lastly, we saw how can we redirect investment that were coming into the country or what the country was doing as well in terms of it, it be aligned to the sustainable development concept, bearing in mind the social and environmental impacts. Uh, so as well as being an island, we have to be very cautious about the carrying capacity. How much can we contain? Right now, a population of 1.3 million, we're just containing 1 million, more than 1 million tourists a year. So we were just thinking as well, whether that is sustainable, how can we do that? So those were the things that we, we, we were thinking as well. So that was the plan, how we thought that we should be working on the green economy. And then we adopted what we call the four step approach because to move to green economy, uh, to, to move to a green economy, we had to develop new policies. We had to revise our existing policies and a lot of changes was to be made. And then we say a new, a, any new policy that you want to enact would never stand in a vacuum. So bearing that at the back of our mind, we, we, we had that four step uh, approach. So first was to make a full assessment of the existing policies because we had we had some very good policies in all the sectors in Mauritius but when then we see all why our all our indicators are still moving into the red and we are not getting the results those policies were not delivering on the objective fixed and we are not getting those outcomes 
So we said it's the best thing to do is like, let's start by going down maybe 10 years down the line and try to assess the existing policies to see what has worked and what hasn't worked. And if it hasn't worked, why? And if it has worked, why? So that we can have a full data on, on, on and, and we can really try to learn from those lessons and, and keep those good things that has made some of the policies work and others have failed bearing in mind that we should not be repeating those mistakes again. Then the other thing we said, okay, because a policy uh, cannot involve in a vacuum and to implement a policy, you need to have a regulatory framework in place and to see. So the other thing we started doing is that we were started analyzing all our regulatory framework, 123 laws were assessed, those very much connected with the sustainable development context. And we try, we deep dive to see what were those gaps, which were not, which we need to address in a, in, in a way to, to push the country into that sustainable development agenda. So we, there was a lot of gaps, I can tell you, which we saw in our laws, and then we started trying and to align the laws. In fact, uh, we, we also, we didn't invent anything. We just tried to see what other countries, for example, uh, some other countries had developed environmental laws, so we were just looking into that as well and trying to to develop some criteria as how we are going to assess our regulatory framework. That was done by experts. And one thing we uh, we said when we started this project, we are going to have local experts, universities to work on it because they know the situation much better, and then we can discuss thoroughly with them. So that was one strong point in our process is that we use the local know-how and knowledge in the country available for this piece of work without excluding support from external consultant on that piece of work. And then we, 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 we analyze the regulatory framework and then we also try, we assess all the uh, bodies that we have that has been set up for delivering on those policies, whether uh, these bodies are really now they can deliver, they have the resources, they have the, they have the, the people, they have the know-how to deliver on what they do and why some of these uh, uh, institutions have failed to deliver on what they were supposed to be delivering uh, uh, regarding policies that were put in place. So we, we also analyze and assess the delivery mechanisms and the implementation process uh, regarding those policies. And then also at the same time, we did some uh, resource evaluation uh, regarding those institutions. And all those flaws, gaps were noted so that whenever we develop our green economy, we need to address all these steps so that we don't make the same mistakes that we've been doing uh, for like 10 years. You know, what has happened in a, in a particular point in time, we discovered that one, when one policy was not working, the government came up with another policy just to correct that policy and it made that situation more complex. And that kept going in so many areas. We had that government was just uh, enacting policies to correct former policies that were not working instead of going to the root causes to try and understand why those policies were not working. So we, we had a different approach. We went to the root causes why those policies were not working. And we saw while we were doing this exercise, we saw that there was a lot of policies that were just put in place to correct or maybe to try to redress some of the policies why they were not working. And that made the situation much more complicated than we thought initially. So despite a lot of good policies endorsed by our government, eventually uh, we, we were not witnessing a tangible change. That's why we went more deeper inside trying to understand the root causes and uh, all the failed policies. We map out all the syndrome and eventually we were just figuring what were the new policies that we need to put in place to correct the failed ones. And, even, and to that, to try to find out if the objective and outcomes in the policies uh, were really working, if not, what will be the new outcomes and objective that we need to do and how do we also measure the degree of success uh, that uh, we really want to achieve? And more importantly, we wanted that everybody in all those six sectors, especially the technicians at a higher level or even to the lower level, do understand 
the flaws and the gaps uh, in each of their sector. There were specialists in the area, but then we wanted really we wanted them to own the process as well to try to understand the flaws and the gaps in the system. Because it's not like we were not blaming anybody. We say, okay, now we just want to give a new turn. We're not blaming anyone, but it's good that we do endorse that somehow, somewhere we failed into our job uh, of trying to achieve the objective and outcome that we were supposed to. Um, but let's turn over the leaf and let's look anew ahead. So that was a little bit the mindset and the spirit in which we were working. And then, like I said, uh, our green economy action plan, we were just developing our green economy action plan. And we had six entry points, agriculture, energy, transport, manufacturing, tourism, sorry, tourism, waste, uh, and, and water sectors. And, uh, and those, those were identified. Uh, it, it was not chosen by us. It was identified uh, during we had some process. We had a stakeholder consultation. And those were being identified as the major entry points for our Green Economy Action Plan. Based on what? First of all, on the contribution to GDP, how much these sectors were so influential in the economy of the country, the employment creation, how much these, uh, uh, how much jobs each of these sectors created, and and they were like, they were they were the heavyweights in terms of our economic structure, their global competitiveness. We are a small country. We need to export, and uh, we do a lot of imports. So how do we also measure uh, what we were doing in terms of being globally uh, competitive? And lastly, would have been as well. Uh, now, what would have been and what were the environmental impact of these sectors on, on the ecosystems of the island? So we, what, as we went along, we find out that these sectors were not only interrelated, but also reflect the country's challenges as they relate to food security, water security, dependence on imported energy. Uh, just to give you the small story, Mauritius is 75% coal lock, and we import all our coal from South Africa. And um, there is a lot of traffic congestion. The latest report from the World Bank has shown that traffic congestion is costing the country 5 billion rupees. Uh, one rupee is more or less like one US dollar is more or less fluctuating uh, around 30 to 35 uh, rupees. So traffic congestion. And then eventually, uh, being a small island, we have a lot, we generate a lot of waste as well. And we had a landfill and we knew what the water problem was having a one landfill. So the island couldn't really afford to have a second landfill. So those were a lot of challenges where we started thinking holistically and globally, how do we move the green economy uh, agenda into these six sectors, not working in silo, but work, working more in a holistic approach and, and, and eventually trying to see the linkages between these sectors and how can we use all our resources and in the best way we can, so that we work more as a team, as a global team, to push the green economy agenda. The good thing with the Mid Commission, which was driving this whole project, we have a Minister of Environment that was doing all the environmental work. They were responsible for EIAs. They were responsible for a lot of other stuff. But this Mid Commission was just driving the sustainable development agenda of the country. And the sustainable development agenda of the country was driven at the apex level from the prime minister's office. So it had a lot of punch. It was very punchy. And we were using that a little bit. That's fundamental and very important in the process. Because if it, it is from the apex, from the highest level, then eventually you can make changes. You can really be influential. So that's our advantage of being there at the apex and then trying to direct the work uh, globally, but working as a team, of course. So, um, so how were how were the key sectorial green indicators chosen? I said that we had a plan; we were developing our plan. But the other thing was, uh, it's important to measure the policies we are putting in place, and and as well to to really try to understand uh, if we have we because the whole green economy agenda was to be about. How do we change policies in the country in those six areas? So we had to develop indicators for policy formulation. And then when you do policy formulation, so we had also to develop indicators for policy assessment, assessing whether eventually uh, what we were putting in place in terms of policy, they are really good. But also we had to 
design poly, uh, indicators for policy monitoring and evaluation so that we know how much successful we are in the way we want to approach things. But that the key green indicators were chosen on, on like four major things, the policy relevance, right? So I'm not going to go into detail, but you all know that we were just trying to understand that the indicator that we want to develop needs to address the issue, actual or potential, right? Public concern relevant to the public policy making. In fact, it was more about trying to see how relevant how relevant that policy is in, 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 in for us to move our green economy agenda in that particular sector. Whether, that, whether those indicators that we are going to use, where we can, they have analytical soundness. So they are very much based on scientific evidence. We can really analyze them and then draw conclusions from them. They must be easily measurable so that you can, you can produce set of data which you can follow progress or monitor progress, etc., And you can communicate with it. More importantly, there's a communication. How do you communicate uh, on your indicators that you've chosen? You need to have a rational, how to explain that. So all these, so we based our development, our sectorial green indicators were chosen based on these four, uh, I would say, concepts. So that's a little bit the process that we've been doing. So we had like, uh, we had the meat commission, we had the meet PSAP, which we call it the project and strategic plan, which was there. And eventually, uh, that was an indigenous plan. And then eventually, to complement that plan, we came up with a green economy action plan, which was very much coherent and aligned to that. And then we started reviewing the policies. We started looking at the regulatory framework. And we started developing indicators so that we can move our green economy agenda holistically and globally uh, to make the change in the years to come. So that was a little bit the whole concept and the whole project. And now I will most probably choose one sector at a showcase. We had six sectors that will take a lot of time. So I will just quickly go through one sector and to show what we did. And eventually I have the data, I have the indicators for other, the five sectors as well. I can share that at a later stage. And if you have questions, maybe I can just also uh, dig, dig into the details of that. So I'm just going to choose the agricultural sector so the next, we had like two problems identified, two major problems identified in the agricultural sector. One, it was like the country was eventually, uh, we, had, we had a privilege arrangement with the European Union to buy our sugar by the Lomé Convention. But when the Lomé Convention, we got rid of the Lomé Convention. So uh, that sort of privilege uh, arrangement, commercial arrangement with the EU broke down and then sugar had really not that commercial value anymore and a lot of people, especially small planters, were abandoning their plantation and uh, at a rate of around 10% yearly and uh, we were just losing our uh, sugar, cover sugar cane plantation coverage over the island, lots of abandoned fields around and it is still like this, there are many You've seen in many corners, small planters were so discouraged because that was no more economically, it was not viable for them. So they had to shape their own, abandon their fields. So that was a, one of the major problems we had witnessed in the agricultural sector. And uh, so our first problem that we identified the conversion of agricultural land to other uses. So then we developed a set of indicators for that. Some of them were there and others we had, we had to develop. Uh, so when you see when you go through this uh, um, I'm just trying to figure out like for example in the agricultural sector 46 indicators were identified only 22 indicators were available and we had to develop the 24 just to give you an idea how, how it is and uh, while well, I didn't go into the details how we collect our data we've got a well-structured statistics office and there's so many other institutions that we do get data from them. So I didn't, I didn't go into that details. Maybe if there's any question, I can answer to that. So what we did in the agricultural sector, we had like what we call an indicator of issue. That was the issue that we were, uh, we were trying to address. And um, that uh, addressing those issues would like, um, it will, it will eventually, while we're developing these indicators, would help you to identify 
and frame the issue. And eventually, after that, we've seen so many indicators were there, area of land under agriculture, uh, agriculture, the area of land under sugarcane, so that what, what was under sugarcane plantation, what was under crop plantation, volume of agricultural production, tons per year, the number of farmers in the food crops, which is around 23,000 for a small island, average of farmers in the food crops, the population, etc. So those were the indicators of the issue, which was trying to help us to frame the issue we were trying to address. And then secondly, we developed another two set of indicators. One was on the policy formulation. So the, one of the policies we say, okay, food security is a major challenge for us. And how do we really uh, develop food security targets for strategic commodities? What would be the percentage? Uh, we do a lot of imports in Mauritius and we wanted to change that a little bit. So what would be the incentive that we need to give? Uh, in the mid commission, the mid PSAP, we had what we call, we had a project called the Green Agricultural Practices. It was about how do we shift our agriculture uh, to become a more green and more ecological. And that was a project for maybe 10 years. And we, we had developed our good agricultural practices based on European norms, but also based on the SADC uh, norms. And we, we were developing our uh, very much like our bronze, silver, and gold level, and trying to uh, help the 23,000 farmers to start entering our bronze level, uh, which had certain criteria, and those standards were developed by the Standard Bureau. So it was all worked in a structure. We had developed also a lab, and uh, we had given a lot of finance to, to create a lab, and we were training people as well. Uh, to be on the ground to test that. So, I mean, I'm not going to those details, but that was the process how we were embarking on it. And then we were developing these indicators to see how do we measure that. And the second, third set of indicators was for the policy uh, evaluation. That was about the volume of ag agricultural production, food security for strategic commodities. Eventually, strategic commodities for Mauritius is potatoes, onions. We, we, we started growing rice as well, but, but rice is our staple food and we import a lot of rice. So, but we don't have really, uh, I mean, our land is not suitable for rice cultivation. Uh, we started on with one hybrid variety, but uh, um, I don't know whether that was a good thing to do, but the major community was potatoes, onions, etc. So those were the, um, those were the criteria for indicator policy evaluation. And then I will come quickly because I think I'm running short of time now because then the second problem in the sector was the misuse of agrochemicals in the agricultural sector. Uh, because if we wanted to, to move to, 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 to green the, the, the agricultural sector, if I may use that term, then eventually we have to get rid of all the chemicals, pesticide, insecticide, and everything that we were using and the farmers were using. And that was, the other big problem we were trying to address. And then we had our indicator of issue. We had our indicator for policy formulation. And then we had also developed our indicator for policy evaluation eventually. So in a nutshell, the policy, when, when we're working on that, it was about like uh, one, one of the indicators, one set of, the indi one set of indicators try to frame down the issue so that we can really understand it. The other set of indicators was providing solutions uh, uh, to tackle that issue. And the third set of indicators were to how do we evaluate progress and measure success. So that's it. Uh, I've got for, for the waste sector, but it's a, it will be the same trend. Uh, first, we had also identified two problems there. The increased volume. Yeah, so I'll stop here. And um, I'll thank you for your attention. And I hope that that has been helpful, really. And I was quite clear in my situation. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Sunil. Uh, th there were there were questions during your uh, during your speech. Uh, you may want to to, to answer one um, very shortly. Uh, how it works the implementation of these indicators? through which measure you can then use them to steer concrete development 
in the sector of agriculture yet, for example. And now you do you cope with um, with the resistance, of course, of uh, of actors that uh, would be um, would be uh, penalized by these policies. In a, in, a, in, a, in a very short uh, short way, please. Uh, that's a very good question, and in fact, I told you that uh, we were facing 23,000 small planters, mainly those growing crop. But what we did is we, we went into a sort of a big PR exercise. I went around the island meeting them slowly and explaining to them and mm -hmm. showing cases how the population is being affected by disease, like the increase in lung cancer. I, I don't say that is related, but I mean that could be that could be a reason. And we went just around to show to them. Eventually, when shifting when shifting uh, from uh, from the actual the actual practices they were having in agriculture to become more bio uh, or ecology uh, friendly. Eventually, there had to be a trade-off, and we were ready to to do that trade-off in terms yeah. of subsidizing subsidizing a little bit uh, because growing bio vegetable will take longer time. The yield will be less, and and there will be you know so there will be losses for them. And so we had a package to compensate them for that, so that we do encourage them into getting inside that scheme. Thank you very much, Sunil. Really very interesting uh, this concrete example. Uh, we will come back to you uh, during the discussion at the, uh, after the, 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 the next two interventions. The, the next one uh, uh, will be Jose Pineda. Uh, Jose, you can switch on your uh, your camera. Hi, hi, Jose. Nice to meet you. Uh, to see you here. Uh, please, you have the floor for your uh, for your uh, presentation. That is, uh, in a way, the heart of the today's seminar. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, to use uh, my first uh, slide to to do a little bit of the transition be between the previous presentation and this one, uh, because this is part of a continuation of the work that uh, UN Environment and Page has been doing on working on, on indicators. So the the main objective of my presentation today will be to introduce the uh, green economy progress measurement framework, and when we uh, set up uh, this uh, line of work, I think a couple of years ago, um, we we have three main objectives. Uh, one was to develop um, this uh, useful tool, I think, uh, that that could help countries to, to measure and to make assessment in their progress towards a, an inclusive green economy, but also to relate uh, the progress that we are measuring on green economy with the overall uh, sustainable development goals, uh, since we strongly believe that an inclusive green economy is, is a tool that will help us to achieve uh, the broader sustainable development goals agenda. And, and finally, I think, uh, was to articulate any effort that we do at the global level uh, with all the efforts that have been uh, done, and, and, and we just saw uh, one of the experience of, of Mauritius uh, at the country level. Why? Because at the country level, we want to have a methodology that is able to uh, help countries to, to achieve uh, and to measure the progress that they're uh, achieving in terms of uh, their own national priorities. So we want to have a framework that was um, able to accommodate to these uh, different uh, contexts of or different countries, but also that could be uh, flexible enough that could be applied to uh, country specific indicators. And, and that's the bridge that we aim with this uh, framework between all the previous work that we have done in terms of country applications with the one that we want to do in which there is more like a global um, measure that will allow also us to, to do international benchmarking and for countries to learn from other experiences. Um, so the, the, the main idea, and, and I have seen uh, previous questions from the audience, is that measurement is, is a significant challenge. And, and this quote is particularly relevant for us because uh, 
the case of the green economy, I think for me, in terms of uh, the whole development agenda, I think it's for the first time we can see that the, the policy agenda and the conceptual um, um, development and how we should move forward in terms of, 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 of development is ahead of the measurement. So we, we have concepts which are really multidimensional, concepts that are relatively complex, like the inclusive green economy, and all of a sudden we, we have limited indicators, we have limited data, we have limited methodologies. So uh, that that's why we choose to put this quote here to say, you know, uh, the green economy and, and sustainable development is something that really counts, but it's difficult for us to, to, to have all the available data that we may need or we may wish to have uh, available to us to do so. So I will go a little bit more into detail about these uh, specific concerns, but that was the main purpose of this of this quote. Okay. Um, then uh, I, I want to, to talk uh, about the, the measurement framework. So the measurement framework for measuring uh, progress on green economy has three major components. And these three components, uh, one, the first one is what is called the Green Economy Progress Index, which is um, a weighted average, and I will talk specifically in a few minutes about how is this uh, weighting process done, but it's a weighted average across a multi-dimension uh, set of indicators that gave us an idea about how countries are making progress in this multidimensional complex uh, phenomenon, which is the, the inclusive green economy. What is interesting about this index is that the weighting process is reflecting uh, targets and thresholds which are relevant for, uh, uh, particularly for, 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 for green economy. The second component is a separate component which is a dashboard of sustainability indicators. Why? Because the idea for us is that uh, we understand that achieving uh, progress on green economy implies that we do so within the planetary boundaries. And that's why we wanted to bring some of these as elements of the strong sustainability um, into, into the picture, but we understand that we may have conceptual challenges if we want to combine something that may reflect more the current uh, well-being of people with something that is more about the sustainability or, or the well-being of the future generation. So we, we conceptualize uh, the framework to have all the elements that we want to measure, but we were very careful uh, not to uh, create uh, probably hard to interpret or maybe subject to significant challenge uh, combination of issues that we'll, we'll be measuring um, weak kind of uh, sustainability indicators with something that may be considered more of the strong or related to planetary boundaries. But um, having said uh, that, we, we were up to the challenge and we uh, developed a methodology in which we create an overall assessment of the progress, which is the, what we call the GEP plus, which is an, an, an assessment by combining the information that we get from the GEP index and the dashboard of sustainability indicators in a way that we could make an assessment about the overall progress of countries in terms of uh, green economy. In terms of specific indicators, uh, we uh, have selected uh, for the application of the, this methodology as a beta test to see how the methodology could, could be applied. We have selected 13 indicators. that You can see in blue uh, in, in the slide. Um, and these are 13 indicators that will be combined into the GP index. And we have selected six indicators that will be part of our dashboard of uh, sustainability indicators closely related to, to planetary boundaries. Again, uh, we select these indicators because we, we wanted for them to have a close or as close as possible match with the inclusive green economy narrative. We want indicators that have a relatively uh, good data coverage 
why in terms of countries because we wanted to do uh, an international ranking so having as many countries as possible is, is critical but also uh, time coverage which is something important and an indicator that you want to have uh, that measure progress so you want to have some time dimension in your indicators and that puts a lot of pressure in the type of indicators that you may uh, select finally we wanted to have two key components. One is transparency and comparability. So those uh, indicators, we try to select indicators that are come from international sources in which they do a lot of um, uh, homogenization and standardization of these indicators. So we can have indicators that we can do international comparison with, with them. And finally, we want to have explicit linkages between the indicators that we use for these um, measurement of, uh, of progress in the economy and the sustainable development headline indicators. In particular, we were able to uh, have and establish at least 14 direct linkages between the indicators that we were using and 10 of the 17 SDGs. So in that sense, we are trying to create a framework that understands Two things. One, the close connection between making progress on green economy and achieving the sustainable development goals, but also understand that at the country level, there is a lot of pressure that uh, countries may be experiencing in measuring some of the indicators related to the SDGs. So you don't want to create a platform that will impose additional pressure on countries to create additional set of indicators. So we wanted to have uh, an index that we'll be able to use some of the efforts that uh, already are going on at the country level to capture some of these um, different dimensions of sustainable development and also uh, try to use a subset of those indicators to capture the contribution that uh, advancing in green economy may have towards the sustainable development goal. So that I think in, in a pragmatic way, I think it's a good message that you don't want to go to a country and then impose additional an additional set of um, restrictions or, or re requests for uh, already overstretched and probably under-resourced uh, national statistical offices. So the, going more into detail on, on the specific components of the measurement uh, framework, uh, the GEP index is, is, is the first component, and it tries to measure how much progress uh, countries have in advancing towards an inclusive green economy. And the idea is that we will have um, a multidimensional problem um, that's the first thing. So we need to are embracing the whole idea that we have a multidimensional problem and green economy is, is compounded on many aspects. Uh, the second, which is, is, is important and will make clear differences between this uh, framework and other existing frameworks uh, that we have to, to capture um, the green economy, will be that this will focus on progress. That means that we will have a specific uh, focus on um, having changes over time and that impose additional pressure on the kind of data that we may have. And, and finally, I think we want to relate uh, a measure of progress with two relevant indicators of any policy making um, assessment. Well, many, many times when we discuss about policy, we said a series of targets. We set a series of desired changes that we would like to have in, in, in our battery of indicators for, for policy, but also we, we have in many times uh, indicators that tell us critical thresholds from which we want uh, our indicators to be either away from or to be above those, those indicators. So this this idea that we will have a measure of progress that is related to targets and threshold will be critical to this framework. To be more specific, and, and these, these are just formulas to, to guide a little bit what we mean, uh, when we calculate progress, it's, it's a very simple concept. A progress will be a ratio between 
the actual change that we see on a particular indicator with respect to a desired change. And, and we have two distinctions. One is for something that is good. Let's say we want to increase um, the share of renewable energies in our old uh, energy matrix. Well, uh, in that case, we will have a desired increase. The question is how much we compare the progress that we achieve, the, the change in actual share of, of renewables with respect to that target. So if we, for instance, one will be a relevant number here. If we, the actual change that we have is higher than our desired change, we will have a progress which is greater than one. That's as simple as it goes. In the case of something that is bad, let's say inequality, or let's say that we have too much of material footprint, um, then we will have a desired uh, reduction. And that's why you see at the bottom of the slide that we will have, uh, uh, for something that is good, uh, a coefficient that we want the initial value, which is y0, to be multiplied by something greater than one. So it means we want that indicator to increase, but for something that is bad, we want a coefficient that is less than one. So we want the next future value, which is y1, to be uh, uh, declining. What we have here in this formula is something that is also simple. The idea that uh, we want to have countries that are at least in the right side of the relevant critical threshold. So it means that either if, if by choosing this uh, beta or, or lambda, we, we are still below the relevant threshold of sustainability or the relevant threshold for us to be on a safe space, then we will say, you know, the desired change for that particular indicator for that particular country should be that at least be uh, on the right side of the target. And that's the main idea that we are making progress to be related to a desired change, so a particular policy target, but also the policy tiger target has to be ambitious enough so that if the policy that we are making is still not uh, close enough to the relevant critical threshold, we will say, no, you should make an effort in your policy making to be on the right side of the critical thresholds for sustainability. The, the second component is a weighting system. And the weighting system, uh, what I wanted to highlight here is two main components. We have one component, which is the idea that we will have a first weight related between the initial position that each country may have on each particular indicator and how is this related with respect to the threshold. And that will give you an idea of priority. For instance, if a relevant a critical threshold for material footprint is five tons, um, then per capita, then you may say, okay, if I am, let's say two, maybe progress on that area is less important if instead the case will be I am 20 pounds, 20, 20 tons. Why? Because then you are way off of the relevant threshold and that's how we use this relevant information that will be country specific and indicator specific to do the initial weighting. The second round of weighting is that we have progress on each particular indicator, but the GEP index is a, is a composite index. So we need to then see how each of the particular indicators is doing with respect to um, the relevant threshold. In that case, what we do is a second weighting in which we compare all the weights related to the single indicators and that gave us a relative uh, importance across indicators. Uh, we have shown in the methodological uh, annexes of, of, of the publications of, of this methodology that this will allow us to do comparison across indicators, but also comparison across countries, which is also something that was one of the initial um, goals of the, um, of, the, of the methodology. And finally, uh, we have a dashboard of indicators that we don't want to mix with the GEP index because we think that uh, we will, it's part of this discussion of the strong versus weak uh, sustainability. So we, we, we think that it, 
it will be very uh, challenging for us to uh, mix uh, these two and to assume a, a series of trade-offs. We have done is a different, a different approach. What we have um, done is to use the information that we have from the dashboard, progress on each of the sustainability indicators, and the GEP index, and we make a final assessment in the overall country uh, progress uh, by using that the country will be assigned uh, a certain level of progress if that country um, based on the list of the achievements across this. And, and when I will show you the practical application, I will go in more detail. But the whole point is we use the information from the index, which of course, uh, since it's an index, it has a lot of substitution across different indicators with the dashboard, which is not allowing um, any substitution, but we then with the overall ranking that says we will rank countries according to the least performing um, uh, across all these in, uh, indicators, we are able to combine the two, but in a way that is not highlighting uh, any of these potential trade-off. If any, in fact, we are saying uh, there is no trade-off, we should move forward in all directions and your overall progress will be measured by the one that you are lagging the most. And that's the main logic of this overall. In terms of specific um, um, results, um, what you have here is the progress, the average progress of the main uh, statistics of progress in each of the 13 indicators that are used for the GEP index. And as we can see, um, the average uh, performance is of progress in most of the indicators, but indicators like material footprint and air pollution are indicators in which many and the majority of countries has been experiencing regress. Okay. Um, what we see here um, is the, whole, the whole data for all the countries included in our sample, uh, which uh, is uh, 105 countries for the GEP index, which is a relatively uh, a large number given the, the, the significant challenges in data collection. And let me explain to you how you read this. So the black uh, line, which is uh, at zero, separates values which if you make a progress, then the value will be above zero. If you make regress, the value will be less than zero. Another two relevant values would be one, that means if you are above one, you are making progress more than whatever you initially target as a, as a policy, or if you are minus one, then you are deviating completely from your initial set of policies. As we can see, the majority of countries are above the zero line, and, but there are a few that has uh, made significant regress, and the particular country that you see there uh, with a, a significant uh, minus one number is, is the case of, of Mongolia. This is just a, a, another kind of representation of all the countries in our sample. The darker, the green, it means that relative to other countries it are countries that have made the most progress, and the darker, the red, it means these are countries that have made the less uh, progress. In, 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 in fact, these are the countries that more, make the most regress. They, are, they have moved in the opposite direction in terms of progress, okay? This is in terms of the GEP index. Uh, we can show here a couple of um, summary statistics. On the left side, you will see by region. The first region number one is, is the Arab states. The region number two is the East Asia and the Pacific. Then you have the ECAC, uh, the East uh, Central European countries. You have Latin American countries, then you have South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and the region number seven will be uh, a, a group of countries that are mostly developed. As you can see, in terms of regions, uh, it seems to be the case that East Asia and the Pacific is um, the region, uh, in terms of geographical regions, which has the, the most of countries that has been experiencing progress, and this is concentrated in the significant increase on, on two indicators. One is related to 
um, material footprint has been increasing over the years, and also air pollution, which has also been increasing in that region. And the right panel is uh, we use the groups in terms of the human development index, and we can see that most of the groups of development, the majority of countries are experiencing progress, but the high, which is kind of correlated with the presence of uh, a significant portion of East and the Pacific, uh, East Asia and the Pacific countries in that group is, is, the, is the region uh, in terms of development groups which experience the most progress. This is in terms of uh, the dashboard of sustainability indicators and the dashboard of sustainability indicators is telling us that whoever progress we are having is not necessarily sustainable in the future because many of the indicators related to planetary boundaries, the majority of countries are experiencing regress and the mean uh, progress indicator for all of these indicators is negative. The only exception will be the inclusive wealth index in this sample, uh, which the average is positive, but when we focus on the natural capital component of the inclusive wealth index, then we go back to this idea that many countries and the majority of countries are experiencing regress on this area. What you see here now is um, it's a little bit crowded, but the whole idea was that we, we, I wanted to present the top four countries per group of development according to the HDI group. And the way this is done, uh, you will see a, a column uh, last to, uh, next to, to lag, uh, last, which is called the protective criterion. And this column is the minimum value across the indicators that we are using. So in this, uh, uh, the way it's constructed is I have indicators in three major um, sustainability indicators like greenhouse gas emissions, then nitrogen emissions and land use. And I also have the GEP index. The column of protective criterion is the column that takes me the minimum value of all the progress that I see across these indicators. And that will be the one, as I explained previously, that I will use to do the ranking. So in the very high developed countries according to the HDI, I will see that the top four countries are these uh, periphery or smaller uh, European countries. In terms of high, then you see Jamaica uh, as the country with positive uh, overall progress while the others that are at the top are the ones that will have a negative but less negative than the rest of the group and you could see the same for the other group. So what we did that is that we consider that comparison across countries is, is important but also comparison among similar countries and that's why we think that doing some sort of grouping that puts countries of similar um, stage of development makes sense to, to present some of these uh, comparison results. Um, I think uh, I don't want to, to take uh, too much of, of the time to, to let uh, Andrea Bassi to, to do his, his, his comments and then to have a, a lively discussion in QIA. So I want to, to conclude um, uh, and, and to, to say a few words about the, the key messages that, that I think this methodology is bringing. Uh, in terms of the application, I think, it is, is a methodology that is telling us that many countries, the majority of countries, almost 80% of the countries, manage to have progress in their transition towards an inclusive green economy, uh, but we, we saw significant challenges in indicators uh, related to uh, specific planetary boundaries and indicators related, for instance, to the increase in material footprint or the increase in air pollution. I think that uh, there are important geographical and, and development uh, by development groups differences and heterogeneities, and these are important to understand um, for, for policy analysis. I think that uh, when we compare that initial progress on current well-being with sustainability indicators related to planetary boundaries, then we should be concerned because what the message that this in, uh, methodology is telling us is that uh, that progress cannot be sustained. And in fact, when I apply the protective criterion, which is 
that gave the country the lowest of all the potential achievement in these areas, then I only find that 17 countries out of 100 are the ones experiencing this progress in terms of the uh, combined uh, progress in terms of sustainability indicators and the GDP index. And that's a, a, a troublesome uh, result. So it means that we need to put a more uh, efforts and, and significant efforts in terms of what can be achieved um, uh, in terms of sustainability and to make any progress that we are achieving today uh, sustainable for future generations. Um, the final word that I wanted to say is that the methodology is a methodology about progress. Uh, we have made this methodology um, closer to the GEP uh, and, and, and the green economy uh, progress because we have selected a series of indicators that are particularly related to that, but that could be adapted to um, country specific indicators, to sub national analysis. We have uh, initiated uh, work, for instance, on this area in China. Uh, to, to do analysis at the subnational, subnational level. Um, so I think that the, the, the methodology is flexible enough that could be used not only to make assessment on green economy, but also to make assessment on um, sustainable development goals. So I stop here in, in to, to not uh, take too much of your time. Um, so let me uh, close my, my camera. Thank you. Thank you uh, a lot. Uh, it was a very interesting, very interesting presentation. There were a lot of questions that I will use for the discussion later on. Maybe only one very specific, uh, very specific. It, it was uh, how long is the period that you have considered? So this uh, change, it was in which time frame? Okay, yes. I, I consider the period of 10 years, uh, and 10 years was mostly decided because we have a battery of indicators of different dimensions, and, and we know that economic indicators and economic dimensions will, will change more frequently, but social indicators will tend to change more slowly. And I didn't want to create or I didn't want to do an application in which the variability of, of economic indicators will be the one driving the whole results. So th those are three key, three key things related to application. And that's why I choose a 10 year window in which I could allow enough time for social indicators like inequality or even uh, life expectancy to, to actually change and then to show progress on those areas. But, but definitely those are the things that could be country specific, context specific, but that was the, the main purpose of why I choose this 10 year window. Thank you very much. So um, we will continue the discussion with, with Jose also later on. Now let, introduce, let me introduce Andrea Bassi. Uh, Andrea, hi. Uh, please, you have the floor for a 10 minute presentation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Bruno. And uh, I would also like to thank Jose and Sunil for their presentations. It, it does really trigger a lot of thinking. Uh, it does. Um, in a way, what I see as my first comment is that it is really good to see that you know, this work has evolved a lot over the years. And it's nice to see that we can move from you know, assessing country performance to benchmarking across countries and then connecting even to the SDGs as a broader framework for measuring progress towards sustainability over time. So it is important work and it's not easy to do. Uh, in a way, we, we are looking at opposite ends uh, when it comes to the full customization for more issues and then when looking at um, the progress and that is being measured across 100 plus countries. So what I, I think contributes the most to the discussion about sustainable development. If we, if we were to compare you know, the work that is being done on green economy indices, indicators, and frameworks, as opposed to the more traditional indices, we can think of the competitiveness indicator of the, of the World Economic Forum, for instance, is that this type of work, you know, the green economy work, helps check consistency across the various dimensions of development. So we look at social, economic, and environmental indicators, and the story that emerges from either the Mauritius case or uh, the JEP work uh, shows that 
we need to see whether economic progress is happening at the expense of the use of natural resources. You know, that's what we have seen from the presentation that Jose gave. Or we need to see whether pushing for economic growth is actually increasing inequality, and that may put a break on growth in following years. So I think that assessing that consistency and highlighting that consistency between dimensions of development is really the key factor to consider here when comparing green economy work to other fields. Then, as my second point, it, it has been mentioned several times that indicators should support decision making. And this is basically the ultimate goal for any exercise. Uh, Sunil mentioned that for Mauritius, it was really about finding a new pillar for growth. But it also included you know, the green economy analysis, assessing the performance of past policies so that we can plan them better. At the same time, from Jose's presentation, we see that we check performance against targets. And that should trigger more thinking about what we can do to move faster towards reaching these targets or to invest more effectively so that the efficiency of our interventions actually improves over time. And, and this is, again, one item that sort of links together the country work uh, that Mauritius represents and also the higher level work in trying to assess performance across many countries. It's how these tools can be used to support decision making. Now, uh, we have to highlight that you know, some studies provide information on the historical performance only, and this is mostly done at the country level, uh, not so much at the project level. So the monitoring and evaluation in terms of sustainability is lagging a bit behind, but it's a fast moving application. Uh, we can think of, for instance, the green economy work on indicators getting into full motion around 2010 with the first publications coming out in 2012 and then 13. One GGKP paper actually uh, was comparing approaches across the work of the World Bank and GG, um, the Global Green Growth Institute and then UNEP. So that was an interesting attempt, an initial attempt to try and harmonize this type of work. And it, it was done just a few years ago. So it is important to think of what could be the next developments in the field and how these two types of assessment, the country work and the index, can actually be used to support that. In fact, um, what I see as, as being an important development based on these tools is the assessment of the impacts of future policies. You know, if we are able to identify that there is a need for intervention because we are lagging behind in terms of performance to reach our goals, what tools can we use to identify whether we should use an incentive, a direct capital investment, a new law, or awareness raising to make so that we can make faster progress in reaching our goals? So this is something that I can see both these exercises can support, even if it's not explicitly mentioned in, in the presentations that we just heard. But what matters overall, I think, is that your know, green economy assessment should always include social, economic, and environmental indicators, meaning that any assessment that you would do, whether it's progress at the national level, whether it's for a specific sector and improving the performance of that sector, um, say, for instance, improving nutrition in sustainable ways, like in the case of Mauritius, it should always include a social and economic and environmental dimension. Now, an element of complication here is that the more we dig into whether the indicators are relevant to inform policy, the more we need to capture the country context. And that became explicit when Jose mentioned that the approach that he has been developing with UN environment actually can be customized depending on the country uh, priorities, both in terms of thresholds as well as type of indicators that are included. It, it was even more explicit when Sunil mentioned that you know, they did everything fully customized based on country needs, based on assessment of historical performance and so on. But beyond that, to make things even more complicated, when we start looking at the environmental dimensions in more detail, we start going into spatial explicit dimensions. Because for instance, if you look at the performance of natural capital and how this affects, for instance, ecosystem services and how this ripples through the system uh, through, for instance, social impacts, then we need to know where impacts are happening, where water pollution is increasing, where this is having impact on fish, for instance, and how that is affecting nutrition for the population. So we have made a lot of progress. There is already something we can do to inform policy, but there are challenges ahead to make this more actionable for decision makers across sectors and across you know, ministries, potentially, if we talk about governments. So my next point is about how do we use this information so we see that there is a need for an integrated assessment. You know, it comes out from the SDGs, uh, from the Rio Plus 20 conference. International organizations are stressing that need. 
even beyond the green economy and green growth arena. But what is the demand for actually using this information in the national policy making process? The, the early work of green economy indicators that UN Environment carried out used that framework, used the policy cycle as the entry point to show that indicators can support problem identification, policy formulation, policy assessment, decision making, monitoring and evaluation together with implementation. And that was the foundation of the, the work that Sunil presented. But how are indicators normally used? I mean, we see that these phases in the policy making process are taken care of by different departments within ministries. And when it comes to cross-sectoral impacts, different ministries have the responsibility to check whether the performance is positive or negative, say, on environmental externalities. So it becomes quite difficult to find a direct application for green economy work. And, and that is a challenge that every type of assessment you know, across the field, whether it's GGGI or, or others that are working on this, say WWF at the landscape level, is found all the time. Uh, the diversity of actors, the diversity of the, their needs, and the, the language, the professional language they speak, is, is always very important. What I think is very useful with respect to the presentations we heard today is that we go beyond the, the assessment of what are the relevant indicators, and we start thinking about what are the interconnections you know, behind these indicators. How the performance of one indicator affects the performance of another one how an environmental indicator affects the performance of a social indicator. And so I think that that is the one element, the one contribution that this type of work can provide to any actor you know, across the board, not one or the other, not an economist or an environmental scientist. It can actually support everyone across the board to better understand the ramifications of their work. So Mauritius is a clear example where this full customization was led at the country level and has triggered these exchanges. Then my next point, if we, if we know that this can be relevant work and, and can influence policy making, is how do we determine progress towards the green economy? Uh, and, the, and I ask this, even if Jose has mentioned and, des and described the process that was followed, because most countries are normally expecting from this type of indices to find what is the, you know, the golden rule. How do I perform better than another country in absolute terms? And this is, for instance, what we would see with the competitiveness indicator of the World Economic Forum. But in that case, it's easier because you have a common metric you know, to assess performance. You see whether the environment, the business environment, is suitable for investments. And normally, investors will look at an internal return on investment, some sort of harmonized indicator that tells you whether you're performing well if you go into that country for that specific project. What in this case, the complexity is much higher because it's impossible to tell whether your social, economic, and environmental performance is actually good and will deliver on your policy objectives. Every country has a different perception and opinion on whether we should go more for economic development and what can we accept in terms of potential trade-offs in other sectors, or whether we should slow down economic growth at the moment because possibly we have more to gain in quality of life, in wealth, and inclusive wealth, and so on and so forth. So this is an important consideration, I believe, that that triggers more thinking about the need to customize. So the need to, as Jose said, to bring closer the Mauritius exercise and any index exercise, any benchmarking exercise across countries. And that is a massive exercise. It's very difficult. So again, um, I think that th the work on the JEP is very good in uh, navigating through all these challenges to come up with something that has value and is meaningful for several countries at the same time. The challenge I still see, though, in this type of work is how can we tease out uh, what is so-called endogenous change, so the change that would happen even regardless of specific policies on green economy, and what is the impact that any given policy is having on these indicators. So when we work with a national framework or national data, if you look at GDP, GDP or its growth in a year or, or a following year is the result of the interaction of several different indicators that work at the same time, you know, simultaneously, in different directions. Some are strong, some are weak. So we can have an industrial policy that triggers growth in the industrial sector, say stimulating investments, but that reduces the performance on the environmental side, for instance, for water pollution. But maybe the Minister of Environment has a policy on um, safeguarding certain areas, protecting certain areas that has a positive impact on the performance of the environment. So if you see several competing factors, you know, sometimes they work in synergy, but often we see trade-offs 
that makes it difficult to highlight what change in the final outcome or in the progress comes out of any specific policy at any given point in time. And the complexity here is that you know, these relationships change from country to country. So again, it is very, very useful to start assessing these relationships. And while the index overall provides a framework to harmonize this work, uh, it's always very useful to start looking into specific country performance. That's where I think we can trigger the real discussion about policy. In fact, um, the difference between the targets and the actual policies and provisions is something worth considering. Uh, in a way, the, the index that was presented tells us whether we are moving towards the target and how fast we are moving towards the target. But then, let's assume that we are not making the progress we're expecting. How can we use this tool to help identify the provisions, you know, the specific policy intervention that will get us there faster? Uh, I believe, in a way, we, we don't have the luxury at the country level to do what Mauritius has done, take some time and look at the performance of historical policy, right? policies that have been implemented in the past. If we can fast track that process with follow-up work or something that builds on, on the JEP, that would be great. And we see examples of this in integrating social, economic, and environmental indicators in different fields. Um, there are examples for the bankability of projects, uh, for instance, when it comes to bringing sustainability into investments. Uh, like sustainable asset valuation uh, that, say, the International Institute for Sustainable Development has been developing that speaks to investors and speaks to banks. So one potential option, and I would like to hear the opinion of, of the other panelists as well, is to bring this field, this knowledge to others rather than trying to bring them to you know, a more integrated assessment and a cross-country assessment. So we go to the audience or we develop something that attracts them to it towards us. That, I think, is, is something that is worth discussing. Then, as a final point, I think that there is an important role for, for the index or for any assessment that looks at multi-dimensional criteria, because while it lumps together different dimensions that are somewhat difficult to unpack, especially for, for those that are not very familiar with the statistics that are being used and the databases that are being used, but it, it does focus on you know, these potential trade-offs. And if this can be linked to project-based assessments, meaning assessing to what extent the annual budget of a government or the investments of a company or a pension fund can support reaching stated targets or even go beyond stated targets, that would be excellent. So overall, I think that the, the environment for you know, using or, or um, the openness to using a broader set of indicators has definitely improved over the years. And, and this is why we see also the growth of these initiatives and the work that Sunil and those areas have mentioned. There is certainly more appetite at the moment. Um, I see that you know, it's impossible to come up with a perfect tool, uh, but the combination of, of these two tools, in a way, is, is very important, you know, the country level and the index work. Because benchmarking is critical to sort of trigger um, action from decision makers that you know, want to show that they're performing well. And we see you know, the, the Global Green Economy Index, uh, the GGI, um, as a, a way of estimating the perception of the performance at the country level. So I think that policymakers do pay attention to what they can deliver you know, within their term and how much they can show of you know, the progress that they're expecting being delivered during that period of time. So I think that linking these lines of work uh, you know, the benchmarking with the potential assessment of the visibility of the interventions and the effectiveness of the interventions, and then providing more practical tools that can support the assessment of project implementation, like sustainable asset valuation, for instance, uh, can provide you know, the toolbox that decision makers at different levels need to improve their performance overall over time in a lasting way. And, and this type of approach, when you look at project assessments, would add also a longer time frame, you know, a 40 year time frame over the lifetime of the investments. So I think that some critical questions remain um, for the effective uptake and use of these indicators, you know, green economy and green growth. But it is very good to see you know, the progress that is being made, not progress in terms of the index, but the good work that is being implemented. And I think it, it definitely goes in the right direction. Again, more work to be done, but exciting developments, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Andrea, we have uh, <clears throat> very few time left. We, 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 
we are allowed to continue for a couple of minutes and I, I would I would ask one question to each of you uh, I will start with uh, Sunil then I will come back to to Andrea and at the end I will ask a question to uh, to Jose uh, Sunil um, How useful were in you, you? You have a concrete example, and there were several questions going a bit in the direction how it can be useful this type of, of exercise with indication with uh, specific numbers for the concrete field work for a small business, for um, for a ministry, for um, politicians, for the public, uh, the general public. What is the, 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 what brings more to work with this kind of instrument than the normal policy, policies and the normal, normal way to, to deal? Tune in. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bruno. I, I've seen some of the questions and I'll try to just summarize uh, most of, uh, all of them, most probably in one answer, which might be difficult and complex. Uh, basically, what I want to say is like we've been looking at all the set of indicators, the OECD set of indicators and all indicators that existed. But what we really focused on was uh, what would make sense for us into an indigenous set of indicators that would be practical, that everybody would be used, could use, could be familiar to all the technicians and people working, all the stakeholders, easy, measurable, not difficult to communicate. So basically, built on all that we had, we we had we we moved for more customized indicators that would really make sense for us in 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 the realities of the country, but also trying to link it a little bit to the to the all the framework. So what we did is like basically developing an indigenous set of indicators for us to measure our green growth, and that was a bit our strength. Could be a weakness as well, but it was a strength to start with and to get everybody on board. And um, yeah, uh, though that's most probably the strongest point. And the biggest challenge was like data availability because it's not concentrated in one spot. Uh, so the other thing, because some of, were with researchers, with universities, with private companies. So the other big challenge was the, how do we bring all these uh, people who had data together uh, on, on one table so that we can get their input, get their brains on uh, as well. So that was the biggest challenge and we've been working on that as well. So I hope that that answers globally, the, but the bottom line and in a nutshell, it was trying to get indicators that is simple, understandable by every technicians, not very technical and, and, uh, and especially being very customized to what we want to achieve. Because the reality, the motion reality, might not be really the same reality as well. We might be have some baseline, but we had some very specificities and we kept that in mind all through our work. While developing the Green Economy Action Plan, while developing the indicators, we wanted something very, very down to earth. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Sunil. Uh, Andrea, um, if you if you looks at these uh, different indicator sets that are developed by OECD, uh, the GGEI, uh, and this one, could you make a very short analysis? What are the main common points? Where are the main differences? There were several questions in this direction. Yes. Uh it's not an easy question to answer. I would like possibly also Jose to weigh in on this if you have time, but what I see is that uh, most of the existing indices, uh, like the OECD's work, it, it's mostly about harmonizing, finding a common set of indicators that would work for the countries that they normally work with. Um, so it, it's not so much about identifying progress per se, or what the GGGI offers, for instance, is the perception component. So the, the OECD and uh, the Global Green Growth Institute are mostly looking at, I, I would say, and, and GGGI also used this term, diagnostic indicators, to figure out mostly what the problems are, 
and then start from there to find viable options to improve performance. But they don't necessarily assess performance against a specific target or threshold, like um, what Jose presented. So I think this goes one step further. One slight difference that I find is that in most cases with UACD, we look at productivity in the use of materials, while in the case of the JEP, we have both indicators that are of broader scope that target most of the SDGs, but at the same time, these are flows and stocks. So we, we see emphasis on natural capital stocks and, and how these could be related to you know, achieving targets or improving performance or, or making performance worse. Um, with the GGI, so in that case, uh, we have emphasis also on different dimensions. We look at cities, for instance, also. Uh, so these are all somewhat different exercises that have some common elements. And I think the, the most um, important you know, task for a researcher, or, or this is what I do personally, is to check if they perform differently, why they do so. Uh, in many cases, the underlying indicators are similar, but the approach is slightly different. You know, the weights that are being used could be different. Uh, the, the databases that are being used could be different. Some use primary data sources to come up with their own surveys. Uh, some others use only secondary data sources. Some use existing indices and build them into their own index. Others don't use these indices. They use just one indicator at a time without coming up with a more synthetic assessment. So just to sum up, uh, there are many similarities, but there are also many differences. I think the most important thing to do is to check performance for different countries and then figure out why there are changes. Again, this is not to say that one approach is better than the other. They're just slightly tuned differently uh, to serve different purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now, Jose, uh, there was quite interest in uh, how do you want to continue this work, in which direction do you want, do you want to develop it. On the one side, on the other side, it's very practical. Uh, are these, uh, uh, these indicators freely accessible, for, one can use them, and where do they, do you, they, they, can, they can be found? Hmm? Yes, um, um, thanks for, for, for the question. I think the, to go to the last part, I think was, uh, I didn't want to take too much time, but in the presentation that I use, and I think is already shared with all the participants, you have available the links uh, to all the publications, and in the links you will have the methodology, you will also have the practical application, you will have information about all the indicators, why they were choose, chosen, uh, what are the main sources, um, for instance, uh, we have a question about Mongolia, so there is a detailed uh, analysis about Mongolia, why they, they have certain uh, performance, uh, which are the main responsible uh, indicators for it. So all this information is freely uh, publicly available. And, and the whole idea is uh, not only because we are on a green growth knowledge platform, but is, is to create discussion. And, and as Andrea said, um, when, we, when we have a battery or, or a suite of indicators, the, the most important thing is to understand that why they may give a different picture when we analyze performance and to understand that in some cases it's because there are different emphases, different methodologies. So I, I totally agree with the point made by, by Andrea. Going to the first question, which is a little bit more tricky, uh, we, we, and I will take uh, that as a part of the comments that Andrea made and thanks for, for those uh, um, detailed comments, is um, how we can use this. And, and we are moving together two of the, um, two important components of, of the green economy policy assessment, which are work on indicators and work on modeling. And, and maybe uh, uh, as part of answering Andrea, a way to connect how much certain specific policies could influence the index to move in certain ways. So how much of the total growth could be attributed to a specific policies could be to do a closer uh, link between those indicators, those indices that we are developing, and the work that we do on modeling, in which you have more flexibility to do what if scenarios about certain specific policy, <coughs> excuse me, or certain amount of investment and how they will move indicators in an economy, but we could translate the movement of those indicators into a specific movement of the index based on the targets and, and, and thresholds uh, relevant for, for that economy. So that's a, a, a way that we are starting to think, 
by combining the work of modeling with the work on indicators, but also we could, as we develop these things, we could also think of econometric analysis to do some uh, sort of uh, disentangle of the composition of, of how much of the change in, in a particular index could be linked, uh, knowing that establishing causality is always a, a challenge, uh, but how much can be linked to a specific policy changes or a specific budgetary uh, changes. That may be a way also uh, to go. Um, we are in the process of continuing exploring modifications and expansions to, to the methodology, but also to application to, to country level, as I explained in the case of China and other countries that wants to explore how they can use this to the subnational level with their own set of specific indicators, but also to explore um, more uh, how this meta uh, meta analysis that we did could be could be expanded with other indicators and other um, uh, changes in the methodology. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, and also Andrea and Sunil. With the SDGs, uh, with the results of Paris, it's clear that we are now on the way trying to find solution. We can shape solution only if we can measure what we are doing, if we can assess if we are doing the right things and if we are doing this in the right speed. This kind of discussion about uh, indicators are fundamental for the policy of, of tomorrow. Like the GDP shaped the last century in terms of the development of the global economy, I am convinced that this discussion on the measurement of uh, inclusiveness, resilience, sustainability will shape the next, the next century. Thank you for uh, the interest. Thank you to the three to the three speakers for their contribution, and uh, uh, I will close here this session and uh, wish all a good day.